my name is Joshua Negrera, and I'm the acting director at the Center for Real Estate Finance Research at NYU Stern School of Business. Uh, I'm here with Devin Cremines, my colleague, and we are thrilled to be interviewing Sam Zell, the chairman and founder of Equity Group Investments, and I'll give him an opportunity to introduce himself for those of you who may not know him, which I find hard to believe. Well, I don't know whether they do any more than my name is Sam Zell, and uh, I'm responsible for a lot of real estate stuff. And uh, I kind of do that on, the, on an ongoing basis. Great. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, so we'll get started uh, just by hearing your thoughts on what the trends were in real estate prior to the pandemic and how you see those trends either shifting or continuing once we get through this. Well, first of all, um, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, stepping off a cliff. Uh, you know, the perspective of going from pre-COVID to post-COVID uh, is hardly going to be uh, uh, a walk in the park. Um, you know, I think that the uh, real estate industry as a whole um, has been inflated by uh, uh, government monetary policy. Uh, you, know, it's just, you know, we've had a very buoyant market, uh, both in terms of financing and, you know, general demand. Um, but, you know, it, it seemed to me like, uh, you know, we had, we, we kept moving, uh, you know, the deck chairs in the Titanic rather than, quote, making progress. Uh, we saw things like, uh, you know, we work at Created and despite the fact that, uh, you know, every company that's ever done what they've done, you know, and as I think I suggested that they ought to be renamed the savings and loan industry because we work as nothing more than, you know, uh, borrowing short and funding long. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, you know, and that, and that was before the pandemic. So, you know, uh, WeWork was the biggest single office tenant in New York and London and San Francisco. Uh, certainly hard to imagine. I mean, I didn't think they were going to, I thought they were going to be a problem before the pandemic. Uh, I can't even imagine, you know, I, 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 I don't know how you go and sell somebody on, you know, occupying a seat six inches from another person uh, in 2020. So I, I think the, the, I described the real estate business as generally benign. Uh, you know, it's got a wart called retail, which, uh, you know, is, is, you know, we're, we're going to see, or we were going to see a slow erosion of retail. Uh, I think the events of the pandemic are going to take and turn a slow erosion into a fast erosion. So at least in, you know, I think the statistics are that currently 13% of retail sales are online. Uh, they expected, you know, over the next 10 or 12 years that it was gonna go to 30. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised they went to 30 in 18 months, uh, which of course is gonna create more challenges uh, in the retail arena. Probably the biggest question mark that comes pre and post uh, the epidemic is really what's going to happen to office space. Um, there are some savants who are suggesting that uh, office space, uh, you know, is almost obsolete, and everybody works from home. And look how successful we are at all working from home. Well, I think that. You know, the, the one thing that nobody seems to be focused on is that you can't work from home if you didn't have a pre-existing culture. If you didn't trust the people that you were, quote, talking to on Zoom rather than sitting next to you. So, you know, you took that trust and you took that culture and then you, you know, spread it for a couple of months and guess what, it worked. Uh, 
certainly there will be, uh, I, I really believe there will be, you know, more uh, telecommuting. But nobody that I know of has ever figured out how to motivate by modem. And uh, I can't see that in this current environment. So um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the real estate business is going to change. Uh, the pandemic is something of uh, pretty extraordinary consequence uh, that I think is going to be around in terms of people talking about it. And, uh, you know, uh, I went to high school in the 50s and uh, people still talked about the depression and what it was like. Uh, I think, you know, 10 years from now, people are going to be talking about uh, where they were in the pandemic and, uh, and how they shelter in place and how difficult was it. And, uh, and frankly, uh, you know, there's little doubt in my mind that uh, recovery from it is going to be challenging. Uh, I don't think we're looking at a V-shaped recovery. Uh, I think uh, you could be optimistic and you could, you could call it a U-shaped recovery, mm -hmm. uh, maybe. Uh, but I tend probably more toward a slower, uh, you know, after the, you know, there's obviously going to be an immediate recovery when everything opens. Uh, and hopefully, you know, the real impact will be how will government respond because there will be hot spots. And uh, if we go in and we say, okay, we're going to, you know, attack the hot spots, that's fine. If we go in and say, geez, we better go back to sheltering in place, we can't afford to shelter in place. Uh, you know, we, you know, the, the Congress spent $3 trillion to buy 60 days. You can't afford to, you know, you know the, 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 the cure becomes more toxic than, than, than the disease. So that's kind of where my perspective is on where we were and where we're going. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that, um, Mr. Zell. I think, you know, kind of a question that, that, that I had for you, I think for my, for my generation, it can be very easy to think, you know, um, for example, I was kind of, you know, graduating high school during the Great Recession. So having a very kind of young perspective, I think it can be very easy to see, oh, here we go again, just another economic recession. Can you talk about how, uh, with your perspective, this is this may be different, and this is diff might be different. Well, um, I, I, first of all, um, I have sympathy for you because somebody who quote went to high school in the Great Recession and is you know and has dealt with the last ten, ten years and now this, uh, maybe your perspective on uh, the world is different and not as optimistic as mine. Uh, you know, I'm, I got a nickname called the Grave Dancer, which is reference to the fact that I've bought a lot of distressed assets, and particularly real estate assets. And, uh, you know, the reason I could do that was because I had complete confidence in this country and how it would work. Um, certainly, the Great Recession challenged that, and the pandemic has challenged that as well. So I think that uh, I still believe America is uh, unique. I, I still believe that, uh, uh, that, that the level of excellence uh, in this country uh, will prevail, uh, but it's gonna be a tough period. And uh, I don't see any uh, quick you know, recoveries. Uh, I don't know how soon you know, people are gonna get on a plane, let alone get into a middle seat. Right. Uh, you know, or stay in a hotel or, or et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it was a lot of uh, pontification uh, over the last few years about the sharing economy. Uh, I don't think we're going to be a sharing economy, uh, just like, uh, you, know, I went, you know, I haven't shook hands with anybody in, you know, three months. It's, I've never done that any other time in my life. So, you know, it's going to be a lot of change and a lot of adjustment. And, uh, and we're very much, you know, differently going to be looking at everybody near us than we used to. Right. And kind of going off of that, where do you think the greatest real estate opportunities will be in a post-COVID world? 
and how would you recommend preparing for those at this time? Well, you know, some great philosophers said liquidity equals value. So the word preparation and liquidity are completely tied together. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I've been an advocate of, uh, of liquidity and certainly I mean, been through the Great Recession and many different uh, periods before that. Um, you know, liquidity gives, gives you great power. Where are the opportunities? I, I think the opportunities are more likely to be with individual situations than, you know, uh, retail or, mm -hmm. uh, or office buildings or, now maybe there's no deal good enough in retail to do. It's really a possibility. But whoever is going to, quote, make those, whatever the great deal is uh, of this cycle, uh, I think those deals are going to be made because of the unique circumstances of the situation that's involved. Uh, you know, my guess is that anything under construction today is a potential workout tomorrow uh, as, as one, you know, one perspective. Uh, whatever, whether it's office buildings or whether it's retail, uh, or whether it's housing, uh, if it's under construction, um, it's going to be more challenging than anybody anticipated. Uh, in the same manner, uh, you know, uh, you can uh, you can have a very healthy environment like the environment for warehouses, uh, and that's you know, everybody's flavor of the month. But you know, you can oversupply uh, in a flavor of the month. And it doesn't really matter whether, uh, you know, if whether, um, you know, online shopping is growing at X percent, uh, if the amount of space is growing at X plus something percent, uh, oversupply can have the same impact. So I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's particular asset class. Uh, I think the opportunities will come because of the unique circumstances. And in some cases, you know, the borrower, but less and less the borrower, as, as the borrowers are generally uh, uh, much financially stronger today than they were 30 years ago. So kind of to that, to that same point, and I understand that you, know, you don't maybe have a specific asset view on anything. Do you see maybe any other potentially larger macro trends? Like for example, are you concerned about the de-densification of cities? Um, I actually think that the de-densifications of cities is something some writer came up with uh, to basically, uh, you know, come up with some concept to write about. Uh, I think people have been, quote, urbanizing and living more densely since the beginning of time. Uh, if you didn't want to be dense, you could go to... Uh, you know, non, uh, you know, non-urban Japan. And, uh, you know, all you see are, you know, vacant land and vacant buildings as far as the eye can see. So uh, I don't really believe that, uh, I think we basically are, sh are social animals. Uh, you know, we want to be near people. We want to be near, you know, stimulation, whether it be cultural or uh, physical. And uh, so I think that that's, you know, this is like everybody said after 9-11, nobody's going to want to live in New York. And as you know, everybody lives in New York. <laughs> so I think it's the same kind of uh, tortured thinking. Great. Thank you for that. I know you've had a long, uh, great career, very successful. Uh, what kind of advice have you had along the way? What do you say was the best advice you've received over that period? Well, I, I don't remember, you know, anybody specifically sitting down with me and saying, here, here's what you got to learn, or here's what you got to know. But I get to, I got to watch a lot of, you know, some of the really great players in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the benefits of patience. I saw the benefits of discipline. Uh, I also saw the benefit of being afraid. 
all those things are, you know, very important parts of, uh, you know, the evolution of an investor, the evolution of somebody who takes risk. So I guess rather than somebody, you know, giving me the, the 10 commandments, I think just sitting there and watching the world go by and, and trying to figure out why some people succeeded and a lot of other people didn't succeed. Uh, you know, whether it be taking on too much, whether it be, uh, you know, disregarding risk, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, buying into, de you know, you know, uh, you know de-densification of America, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, ending up uh, out on your pajara. What books would you recommend for students who are looking to go into real estate? What are some must reads if they're <laughs> looking to be successful in the industry? I know you probably have one off the top of your head. <laughs> the one I wrote. <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting that, um, you know, people had told me for years uh, that I had to write a book. And, um, yeah, I kind of said, okay. And, and then I finally said, you know, I really, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I got to go do this. And uh, so then I, and by the way, probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And, uh, and then having, you know, completed it and watching uh, people's reaction to it uh, all from all over the world, it's just been unbelievable. If I had known what a calling card this book was going to be, I would have written it 20 years ago. <laughs> so certainly I, uh, I endorse it. And, and I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot in there that reflects, you know, my experiences. Um, but I, you know, I read a, uh, a biography of Zeckendorf that I thought was really fascinating and was really relevant from a real estate point of view because what, what Zeckendorf did more than anybody else was he broke down real estate and said it's really not real estate, it's land and it's building and it's operating and, and if you leverage, you know, you can really do some really interesting things with it. And I remember reading that book. Uh, I read another book called Kane's World, uh, K-A-N-E-S World. And it was basically a fictionalized story of a real estate developer from Chicago who get killed in a plane crash at Guardia. But it, what you got out of it was that, you know, it, this thing called the developer uh, is really a sickness. And, uh, and, and you just read this book and you say, geez, now I understand why, uh, you know, developers just, you know, they, you know, nothing is ever enough. And, and, you know, starting the next project is more important than finishing the last one and et cetera, et cetera. So it was just a very interesting experience. I'm sure there are, uh, you know, books written by, uh, you know, Ken Rosen or, or, uh, or Peter Littemann that, that are much more technical in nature. Uh, but I'm not so sure that uh, a really good real estate guy needs technology in that respect as much as he needs stories. Because uh, I, cause I think, you know, I think, you know, I was motivated by stories and how other people did things and how I might be able to improve on them. Right. Thank you. We actually, we interviewed Dr. Peter Linneman uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, oh. he, was a, he was a great guest. Well, he's a terrific, you know, he's a, he, I mean, and he is, you know, he, indi he individually is responsible for the bringing of uh, the real estate industry and academia together. Uh, I think what he did at Wharton uh, when he was there, uh, the whole industry has been benefiting from ever since, and uh, the whole modern read era would never have been as successful uh, if it hadn't been for the fact there had been a lot of work at Wharton done at that time. So, uh, you know, just like, you know, uh, you know, there's four or five uh, really good uh, real estate programs in the United States, NYU being one of them. Uh, and, uh, and they have reached out to the industry. Uh, and that's what makes them unique is, you know, you, you know, you know, whether in your case it's the Shack Institute or, or, or Wharton or uh, Lusk or whatever, uh, these are really you know, terrific uh, 
support from the academic arena that is making real estate a much more sophisticated arena. So kind of, kind of to that same point in terms of what do people need is stories. I know that we have a lot of students graduating this May who just, you know, talking about the reality of the current economic environment are probably going to face some level of, of rejection um, to an extent as they, you know, look for jobs and things like that. I know you have a great story uh, when you graduated from the University of Michigan with your JD and kind of as you were interviewing with law firms. Would you be willing to share that story with us? Sure. Uh, you know, I went to the University of Michigan Law School and uh, it was at the time supposed to be among the you know, top 10 in the country. And, uh, and I did okay. I mean, I was never an academic, so I didn't expect to become, to blossom into one uh, uh, when I was, you know, when I went to law school. But uh, I graduated from law school and basically I thought law school was a bore and I thought it was a horrible experience. Uh, but it was necessary in order to get a, a shingle. And uh, so I ended up starting to begin following up on my real estate career while I was in law school. And I built buildings and uh, created a property management company and I made a quarter million dollars my senior year of law school. And uh, so, you know, I, uh, I then wrote a resume with which to get a job. And uh, I included in the resume, you know, all the business I started and all the things I had done and uh, along with my GPA and everything else. And, uh, I then had 44 interviews. I had 43 rejections. And I just, you know, I, I was in the top quarter of my class. I it just didn't make any sense. And, uh, and finally, I was interviewing with the head of, a, of one of the law firms. And, um, and the guy looks at me and he says, tell me about your deals. And I said, tell you about my deals. I want a job. He says, oh, we would never hire you. You'd be here, you know, three months and you'd be leaving and going into the real estate business. So we would never hire you, neither would anybody else. <laughs> and he was right. And, uh, but, I, but I remember I said, to, I said, what about, uh, you know, um, you know, Dallas Street and, uh, you know, and uh, Perry Mason and, you know, in the courtroom and, and and he said, you know, anybody who make you think that the practice of law is, is the drama of, of, uh, of the courtroom, you know, it, it's not the case. And uh, everybody would love to do what you do. And somehow or other you do it. And so he was right. So I ended up spending, I didn't get a job though. And uh, I spent uh, the first four days drafting a contract. And for anybody who's been to law school, you know that, um, uh, you know, when you graduate from law school, you don't know anything about practicing law. Uh, you know, you may know about theories of conflict and, and, and things, but not practicing law, writing a contract. And I wrote this contract for a linen supply company. Uh, and, um, and I realized that this wasn't my calling. So on the morning of the fifth day, I went to see the senior partner and I explained to him that, uh, you know, that I was gonna leave. And he just looked at me and all these women, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll just go back to doing real estate deals as I did before. So uh, that was, you know, that was my whole experience. So the guy was, that, that senior partner was absolutely right. I would have never been, you know, it would have been a bad investment there. <laughs> it's a great story. Uh, so I think now we'll, we'll do, thank you for sharing that. I think now we'll do um, just some questions from students. Hi, Mr. Zell. Thank you for taking the time today. My name is Elliot Pines. I'm a second year full-time MBA student here at Stern. COVID-19 has obviously had a major impact on the office and retail markets, especially in urban cities like New York City. My first question for you is what do owner operators have to do in order to survive this? And my second question for you is how long do you think it will be before the office and retail spaces become viable, bankable investments again? Thank you. Uh, the answer is lower the rents. Uh, I mean, 
that's that's really you know the answer is I mean you know everybody's worried about about street retail. Well, street retail went from uh, whatever it is thousand a foot to five thousand a foot, and you basically chased out all your tenants. So the question is, what prices it will will it take to get your tenants back? And now, retail is a falling knife, and so there's probably less demand uh, than there historically was, and so a recovery to you know, what I would call the, uh, in, in, in retail, by the way, was suffering for the last 10 years. So recovery, you know, to where retail used to be before online competition is never in, in the cards and, and we're never gonna see that happen. Uh, could the retail business be better than it is today? Uh, sure, but that will take a while and, and you know, a little bit of Darwinianism uh, to go from one place to the other. As far as office space is concerned, uh, I thought we had a significant oversupply of office space before the pandemic. If we had an oversupply before, then we really have an oversupply now. And I think office usage is not going out of style. And, and as I said earlier in this interview, uh, yes, it's not gonna be the same as it was, but it, you know, you, you're not gonna end up with the world telecommuting. But I think it's gonna be a while. And therefore, real estate, you know, values and and liquidity in the office market, the retail market, and probably a hotel market is gonna be uh, compromised for a while. And the question is how long is a while? And that depends on whether it's a U or an L. So thank you. Our next question uh, comes from uh, Benjamin Wiggins. He's an MBA one. Hi, Mr. Zell. Uh, thanks so much for making the time for this interview. I was wondering if you could share your perspective on the future of multifamily urban housing and what you see as the biggest trends moving forward in that space over the next five or so years. Thanks. Well, um, I think that there's all kinds of different multifamily. Uh, EQR uh, made a major shift when they went from suburban, uh, you know, where the definition of a good location was expressway frontage, to uh, today uh, anchoring in, in major metropolitan areas where it really comes down to a walking score. Uh, I think that there are, and always will be, uh, a tenant base that wants to live in the middle of urban markets. And I think that tenant base is younger, more professional, and probably older. And uh, I don't think the pandemic is going to uh, continue is, is is going to um, end that basic desire. I think the people who are going to move to the suburbs eventually for that piece of grass for their kids are still going to move to the suburbs, whether they're millennials or not. Uh, but I think the demand uh, in, is related to job growth. The demand is related to diversity and the, and, the, and the ability to, you know, have it all close by. Living in, living in the boondocks is uh, interesting, but not very, not very attractive. Thank you for that. And I want to be respective <clears throat> of your time. Uh, we had one last question. If you have any advice for our real estate students who are graduating, in just a couple of days, what would that be? I guess the word patience uh, is the is the magic word. I think it's going to be slow. I think it's going to be difficult to get a job. Uh, I think that if if I were a graduating uh, real estate kid today, uh, I would try and figure out how to eat. Probably by living at home or something like that, and see if, uh, if I work for free, uh, if that's what it took. But it's all about exposure to experience. And if, if, if real estate is really your passion, then there's nothing you can do that's more relevant than gain experience. And if you, quote, have to pay an apprenticeship, an apprenticeship for it, I like working for nothing or working for minimum wage or whatever the scenario is, uh, 
There's no time in your life where you can risk your time more effectively than at this age. And that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what my focus would be. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Stay Bye -bye. well.